Welcome to Sprott Gold Talk Radio, Season 2, Episode 9. I'm your host, Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Director at Sprott Asset Management. With me today, we have two returning guests, Per Nandir of WMC Energy and John Champaglia of Sprott Asset Management. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us again today on Sprott Gold Talk Radio. Per, I'd like to start with you. A lot has happened in the world of uranium just in the last 30 days, whether it's been announcements of deals happening or just a spot price moving around quite a bit. I think it'd be helpful for our listeners to really hear from you directly on what's going on in the the spot market today and and what does it mean for some of these deals to start happening within uranium? Yeah, thanks for having me on again, Ed. It's, uh, It's great to be back. It's funny, we recorded a last session about a month ago when I'd just been in uh, WMA, the big conference in London, which kind of kicks off the fall season. And uh, just a week ago, we had the U.S. equivalent in Vegas when everybody kind of met up for the first time in three years again. And, uh, in London, it was, a, it was it's a bigger conference. You cover more broader topics, reactor technology, licensing, and all sorts of things. And in the U.S., this conference is much more focused on uranium procurement, nuclear fuel procurement. And it was a tangible difference. Uh, I wouldn't say it was tense. Everybody's happy to see each other again. And of course, you're in a location like Vegas. Everybody kind of relaxes a little bit. But you can just tell in the air that th- there is a lot of contracting going on right now. Uh, it started in the summer with enrichment and conversion, and it's rolling into U308, uh, the yellow cake. And everybody's running around having meetings. You know, there's, uh, there's not that much attendance in the sessions because there's all these side meetings going on. People hold their cards a little close to their vest, don't want to say too much what's going on. But uh, on the public side, there's a bunch of tenders coming out. There is more getting announced in the coming weeks. But just on, on Cameco's big earnings call last week, when they said a lot of the uh, talks that they have are off market, basically bilateral. They don't necessarily come up for tenders. These are ongoing long relationships and deals are being longer. The numbers, I think Cameco said 77 million pounds, the biggest in on track for this year could potentially even be more. And it's the biggest contracting year since Fukushima. So there are definitely things going on right now. And you can just tell that it's it's going to keep going for the next few months. Do you think part of that is because spot price is moving around? Or do you think that's just the general narrative of really governments around the world talking about the future of nuclear power? You know, What do you think is ultimately driving uh, this activity? And, and John, what are you seeing from a market standpoint within spot price right now? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, no, look, it's been very buoyant the last couple of months. You know, we went through, as we mentioned in our last podcast, went through a very, very quiet summer doldrum period where the price of uranium just meandered around $48 for for weeks on end, it seemed. And really, in the last couple of weeks, it's come back to life. And the price, you know, has gone up 4 or $5 over that period, a pound, which is good. But I think what's more interesting than the price appreciation is the activity. And what I'm talking about is we've seen a lot more activity in the spot market in the last few weeks in terms of different parties coming in, buying material. We've seen some some utility buying. We've seen some trader buying. And I think that's very healthy that the market activity has come back to life, which is clearly helping to put in some support around the price. I'll also note that the price of uranium right now is around $52, $53, which is where we were in the springtime, right before speculation about sanctions against Russia really was the catalyst that, to, to move the price from $53 to $63 in, in just a, a very short period of time. So we obviously saw a downturn in the price with the decline in just about every asset class in the world. But I think it's very healthy to see the price return back to the low $50 range again, and it's really been supported by not just buying by the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, but a lot more parties that we're seeing being active day to day. So I, th- I think that bodes well in terms of finding a support level here. Well, you know, one of the things I think you have both mentioned in the past is what price do existing mines either A, come back online that have been dormant, or B, probably more importantly, would be uh, new mines being built and constructed to extract What price do you think you'll see existing mines start to turn back on? Are we already seeing that? And then I guess the second point, which I think is probably the one that more people are paying attention to, particularly those looking at the uranium equity market, 
at what point would you see additional mines start to be built? Or are we already seeing that? It's just not making the news yet. You know, Per, why don't we start with you to talk about that a bit? Yeah, I don't think we're at the price where you see new mines being built just yet. And uh, the big suppliers, they will be the first ones to say that we don't necessarily look at the spot price. We need an incentive price in our long-term contracting. Cameco is turning some of their mines back on, but you look at the Kazakhs, they're still producing below their levels where they are approved to do. So they, they go from minus 20 to minus 10%. So sure, it's an increase, but it's not at all at the full capacity because they just don't don't see the incentive there yet and very busy contracting absolutely big levels there and they're they're making the contracts longer than they traditionally have been but in speaking to price reporters and other consultants in the area what is happening is like the term is getting longer and traditionally you have quite a lot of flexibility in these prices that it could be the volume flexibility you can flex up or down you can have a uh, ceiling prices which basically caps your exposure to uh, to whatever price indicators you have there's uh, location flexibility there's all sorts of sort of added on little bells and whistles on the contracts that have ver been very favorable for utilities and you add up the value of these things they can easily add up to ten dollars a pound almost and those are disappearing and it's more going back to the bare bones contracts and now that there's not much of those you can go remove any longer well the next step you're going to start seeing that uh, term price coming back up so that's what i think we're going to keep an eye on for the next few months here that that's going to start tricking up a little bit well, that's interesting. And I, I guess for sort of the market watchers out there, they're saying, okay, well, what is that price? And John, maybe you could you could shed some light on that. Are we seeing sort of a magic number or a, a price that the market watchers or the potential investors should be looking at? Is it $60 a pound? Is it is it $80 a pound? And is there a different price for the, for the existing mines to come online versus the new mines? What number, if there's a number, should investors be focused on or be thinking about as they watch this market continue to mature? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we, we, we obviously see some very positive signs happening right now. And again, as Pera mentioned, long-term contracts with utilities and producers are really going to drive this market, in our opinion. And you're seeing, you know, the recent announcement from Cameco. And I think this is really important to highlight for people to give them perspective, especially if they're newer to the sector. Last year in 2021, Cameco contracted a grand total of 30 million pounds for the calendar year. Those are pounds sold forward under various contract arrangements. In February, they really shocked the world with a 40 million pound number and added a couple of fives in Q2 and three, and then added another 27. So now they're at 77 million for the year. So we're talking about 77 million so far this year versus 30 for all of last year. And they obviously are tier one producer. They've got incredibly high grade assets in the Athabasca Basin. And that's pricing in the 50s, you know, somewhere between 50 and 58, call it, is a level that provides them sufficient incentive to reopen mines and, and uh, meet long term contracting requirements. If you think about the other mines around the world, yes, they are starting to come out of care and maintenance and, and being put back online. But when you're talking about greenfield production, we still have a lot of road to, to travel. I mean, if you look at some of the most developed next generation of, of uranium mines in the world from, let's say, Next Gen or, or Denison mines, they've just recently submitted their environmental impact statements to obtain their permits to, to actually build those mines. And that's a two-year process in itself. So Supply response is going to come as the price increases, but this sector was so starved of capital for so long that we are kind of running to catch up. And we definitely think that incentive price needs to go up substantially from here in order to actually build some of these mines. I'll also note that in the United States, which historically has been a uranium producing region, we have still not seen any news flow in terms of restarting idle production, even when uranium briefly touched $60 a pound earlier in the year. So that suggests to me that the incentive price to, to restart some of these operations that are based in the United States, we still have a little bit of ways to go before we, we hit those levels. That brings me to the next point, which is you know looking forward, right? We all like to look forward from an investment standpoint. We like to think, well, what's the future hold? You know, As we go into 2023 and, and as we wrap up this year, 
Clearly, month to month, things change pretty rapidly in this market. But as we go into 2023, have you heard, and maybe this is, is, is more for Perry because he's been at a couple of the conferences recently, have you heard projections of what kind of pounds in existing mines are being projected to come out in, in 2023? Do they even think that way? Like, what's, what's sort of the landscape right now of how they're thinking about 2023 from a production standpoint? Do those numbers come out? Do they estimate that? You know, what should we be looking for on, on that side of the equation? I think the, uh, the prediction of how many pounds are going to be produced, it, it's fairly stable. Uh, you don't have a lot of new mines coming online or they're ramping up. That's obviously something that people do follow. If anything, there's been some slight hiccups. Uh, so had maybe produced a little bit less than planned this year, and that may or may not continue into next year. But I think that the big uncertainty is on the demand side, where you have all across the timeline it's like it, it ranges from you know immediate need for example the reactors they're going to keep being online in in california potentially restarts in michigan certainly in europe germans keep their online and some of the other reactors who just have life extensions approved as well i mean they need to be by for more or less immediate uh, need and then you have a few years further out in time. Some of the reactors, are, again, life extensions, that matters right away. All the Japanese ones are coming back on. That certainly adds to it. And then you have on the more longer term, then, for example, Poland announced uh, last week on Friday they're going to build six new uh, Westinghouse reactors, which is fantastic news both for Westinghouse and Cameco as a new part owner, of course. And they stay online for you know, 60, 80 years. And we had some great news in Canada, even, where it was announced that a reactor in Ontario got governmental support. I think it was just under a billion Canadian. That's a tangible project that's going to go forward now. And if it's going to come online in 2028, well, you're going to start building the fuel for that in only a few years. So it's actually, whereas people think that SMR movement, well, that's you know, 10, 15 years out in time. Well, it turns out it's less than five. So that's something that's definitely worthy of keeping an eye on because once that demand comes online, then it, it can definitely move pretty quickly. And Perry, you said twenty. Would you say twenty twenty eight is when those are expected to come online? So is it fair to say it takes typically five to six years to build a new reactor? When when one gets announced, from the time it gets announced to the time it gets built, are we talking basically a half a decade? It depends on the size of it, of course. I mean, you've had some really significant delays on the on the really big reactors that have been built. But you know, that's again, that's a lot of experience now from the rea from the reactor vendors that built those that they can use going forward. So the ones in France and Finland, yes, they dragged over a long time. Vogel in Georgia, same thing. But now you have the the building experience from that, and at the same time, you have really good success stories in uh, the Emirates, for example. The Korean reactors there turned out more or less on time. But these new reactors that we're talking about in Canada, for example, that's the smaller kinds. And uh, the licensing have been working on that already. That's uh, This particular one is, uh, is GE, I believe, and, and Rolls-Royce is working on some of them as well. And they're going to be much, much quicker to build because they're not prefabricated, but the modular, if you will. So modules of it are prefabricated at the different site. So the assembly is going to take a lot shorter as well. So now we're looking at, at the very most, I think, five years, but it's a very exciting development and it's changing every day. So it, it's definitely something worthy of keeping an eye on because it just accelerates the overall demand for it. While in the background, you of course have these really big stable reactors that underpin the national grids that are going to be, they're going to be around, they're going to coming online and they're, they're staying online once they're built as well. But it's, it's just so much going on that it's yeah. almost that the landscape changes on a daily basis almost. Well, it's amazing. It seems like a very exciting time. And, and, you know, the next probably let's call it two to 10 years, uh, we're going to remain in probably the first inning of this development, even though it's been around for a long time. And I suspect by say 2030, um, a lot of investors will look back and say, gee, I had overnight success after a decade of planning. It's pretty interesting what's happening in this space. And, and I think I heard you correctly. The, the mine life cycle is typically about 60 to 80 years once these, once these reactors are built and functioning. So, you know, we're looking way down here on a, from an investment path on a supply demand of uranium. Is that correct? You said 60 to 80 years. Did I hear that correctly? For, for the reactors, yeah. yeah they can, some of them can even be longer. So obviously the mines are going to run out well before that. So that's why you need replenishment yeah. of new mines. Then you're looking at a very different production cost uh, level than you are at the existing mines today. So it's uh, yeah, lots more to come in the, in the, in the next few years there. 
Well, that's really exciting. And John, before we wrap it up, let's shift back to you for a second and talk about how investors can participate in this. You know, clearly this is this is part of the future um, as far as energy is concerned, markets are concerned and so forth. But what should an investor be thinking about today? What should they be concerned about? What should they be excited about? And, and, and how should someone think about allocating or participating in the uranium market, in the nuclear market, as they look to make this part of their portfolio? What are some of the things they should think about or consider before they make that leap or add to it if they're currently investing in it? Yeah, well, I, I, was, I would first start off by saying that you know 2022 has been an incredibly challenging year across just about every financial market in the world. And, uh, you know, uranium has actually been kind of a star standout performer this year. I mean, the price of uranium has gone from about 42 to $52 this year. Um, yes, it did hit 63 at one point in the spring, but just about every, every commodity has, has seen a pretty significant pullback. So it's still doing its thing. I mean, it's, it's behaving this way because of the fundamentals. And, and we still believe that the long term, structural supply deficit that the uranium market is currently in is going to be solved with higher prices over time. So I think the thesis is still very much intact and, and the the price behavior of uranium, I think, clearly reflects that this year. From all of the investors we've talked to, yes, they all acknowledge that their portfolios are having lots of pain, uh, mostly inflicted by the Federal Reserve. But most of the institutions we've talked to have said, listen, you know, uranium is the one thing that's actually working in my portfolio this year. So I'm not selling. I'm, I'm, we still are, we're long-term believers. It's working. The fundamentals have never been better. And I think with respect to the physical uranium side, people are holding the line. Now, does that mean institutions are putting massive amounts of capital to work in this sector? I would say, no, absolutely not. There's money coming back into the sector, I would say, in the last couple of months. But it's been at a much more moderated level. Now on the uranium equities, you know, these are equities and equities, irrespective of what kind of equity it is, behave with general equity markets and equity markets around the world have been incredibly challenging. You know, uranium stocks are down about single digit percentage, which is, which is still much better than the broad indexes out there, but they've been very volatile. They had a, a really good pop in July and August and sold off in, in September. And I think, you know, you have to remind people that these are stocks. Um, some of these stocks are smaller cap in nature, which are more prone to this kind of general equity market volatility. It's something you have to be diligent with in terms of your exposures and, and, and what's happening with the individual companies for sure. But many investors that we talk to like to hold some proportion of the physical uh, uranium as well as some of the equities because the equities can provide that operating leverage and that optionality because these are these are many of these companies are developing the mines of tomorrow and it will take a long time to bring these deposits online but they will create tremendous value if they can successfully bring these mines to the market so investors are clearly frustrated not with uranium I think they're frustrated with the just a general macro headwinds that everybody is dealing with but I think you have to kind of take a step back and look at the relative performance. And it's it's been a very challenging year, you know, across just about every asset class in the world. Well, thank you for that. And it seems to me that if an investor thinks more about uranium as a long-term investment and not a short-term trade, and they're patient over time, potentially some real benefits can be had there. So I think this is certainly something that hopefully more and more investors are considering. Uh, well, gentlemen, it's always great to have you both on uh, Sprott Gold Talk Radio. Um, this is certainly a very dynamic market, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time out to join us today. Once again, my name is Ed Coyne, and you're listening to Sprott Gold Talk Radio, and thank you for listening. You have been listening to the Gold Talk podcast by Sprott Inc. For more information and insights on precious metals investing, please visit Sprott.com. 
This podcast should not be copied, distributed, published, or reproduced whole or in part. The information contained in this podcast does not constitute research or recommendation from any Sprott entity to the listener. Neither Sprott nor any of its affiliates make any representation or warranty as to the accuracy or completeness of the statements or any information contained in this podcast. And any liability, therefore, including in respect of direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage is expressly disclaimed. The views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of Sprott, and Sprott is not providing any financial, economic, legal, accounting, or tax advice or recommendations in this podcast. In addition, the receipt of this podcast by any listener is not to be taken as constituting the giving of investment advice by Sprott to that listener, nor to constitute such person a client of any Sprott entity. Past performance is no indication of future results.